الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا مما بعد I want to welcome you all to this very special uh, evening in which we are hosting um, our dear volunteers um, our doctor volunteers who just came back from Gaza they spend most of their Ramadan uh, volunteering alhamdulillah there and being with our brothers and sisters under the circumstances that we all know um, and they sacrifice their time their effort of course obviously just for a the beautiful cause of showing the support, alhamdulillah, to our brothers and sisters over there. So I want to, at the beginning, on behalf of this all-Muslim community that you see here, and all watching with us, I would like to say jazakumullah khairan. Thank you for representing us as the Muslim community here living in America. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your sacrifice, ya Rabbil Alameen. We really appreciate all the effort that you made, so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it heavy for you in the scale, ya Rabbil Alameen. Now, there is so much we need to talk about for the sake of time, inshallah, azza wa jal. Um, I know that they keep saying, or we hear it, say, they say that um, a picture is worth a thousand words. But then they start, when we start using video, we said video actually is worth a thousand pictures. But then I believe personally that there is no doubt that an eyewitness is actually worth a million probably of these videos. You guys are the eyewitnesses over there, and you've seen it you know, firsthand. You were there on the ground. We want to hear from each and every one of you, inshallah, that your experience, uh, what is it like there? Uh, what do you want the Muslim community to understand and know? Because we've seen the pictures, we've seen the videos, we've heard all the analysis and all the reports and so forth, but there is nothing better than someone who was really there on the ground to tell us the reality of the situation. So I'd like to uh, thank you very much for being here. We have actually with us Dr. Haifa Yunus, uh, who was there, alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin, Dr. Farhan, Abdul Aziz, Dr. Bilal, Paracha, Rashad Manbeg, and Dr. Athar Haq. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud Sabha was also on the team. But he's out of town, so he just he sends his salam to everybody and I apologize for not being here with us on this evening. So inshallah, we're going to hear from them. I want to start with uh, Dr. Athar. Your experience. Tell us first of all about your expertise and uh, uh, your specialty. And how was it there for you guys? Yeah, so uh, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Wassalam, uh, Rasulullah. Again, Jazakallah for coming. It's kind of a little overwhelming, uh, a little <laughs> nervous right now. But uh, I'm a hospitalist by profession. Alhamdulillah, I've been doing that for about 11 years. A hospitalist is someone who it, uh, takes care of the patients once they're admitted from the ER. Mm. Um, so I was a little bit on the fence when I was, when, you know, actually Farhan Masha was the one that invited me to go. Because uh, you know when you hear about, you know, relief work, it's, it's mainly surgeons and anesthesiologists and ER doctors, mashallah. Uh, but hospitalists are like at the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, and that, and I didn't speak... You're, you're the khair of barak, alhamdulillah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I didn't speak any Arabic, so I was, I was always thinking, okay, what kind of benefit can I provide the people? Uh, but with uh, the encouragement of Farhan uh, and Mahmoud, mashallah, a big role in that, I, I decided to go. And I think some of the lessons, I guess, when it first started for me was, I don't think the trip could have gone any better. Mm. Uh, SubhanAllah, I know that obviously we're going to a war zone, but before I had planned to go to Gaza, uh, you know, I, I booked a trip to Umrah in the last 10 nights. And I was super excited about that. And my intention, subhanAllah, was when I booked that trip, was I only wanted to go there to make dua for the people of Gaza. Mm. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed my plans just a week before. So I canceled my Umrah trip, and subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, I was able to go to Gaza itself. Inshallah, you'll get the reward of a million Umrah instead. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Yeah. Um, so one of the, I think the, one of the lessons that I learned before I left like that was, that really shook me, is, so I really wanted to go, and you know, my wife, my wife was also, she's, you know, very pro. Uh, so she wanted uh, me to go as well, so very excited. So then once I started preparing for the trip, you know, I started, you know, I prepared, you know, I had my will already prepared, so I, I prepared that, uh, you know, added some things to it. I gave her some access to some of like the, you know, business and accounts and things of that nature. And so once it got like that intense for her, she was like, um, are you sure, are you sure you want to go? Uh, maybe you should just stay. Umrah sounds like a really good idea right now. Uh, but you know, I think that was one thing that kind of shocked me. I was like, okay, well now my wife is even afraid that Initially, she was so excited about for me to go, but now she's like, okay, maybe he's really not going to come back. Huh. And that really it affected me, but it didn't affect me until, like, we were leaving right after football, the Jummah on Friday. Uh, so I, you know, went to the, uh, went to the house, I, you know, we got my, I got my wife, and then I was just, you know, normally when you leave after, for a little vacation or a trip, you make sure everything in the house is settled. So I walked into the house, everybody was gone, and then I was just making sure that everything, the lights were off, so on and so forth. And as soon as I stepped foot in my garage, then this overwhelming feeling of, you know, oh my, this actually might be the last time I come step foot into my own house. Um, and that really shook me. I think that was the first time I, I, I recognized that, you know, what I'm actually signing up to do. And I think that's, that really shook me, subhanAllah. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, that's one lesson that I think that I learned is that even though I felt like I needed Allah the most then, 
But in reality, I need Allah just as much as I did then that I did, that I did then that I do now. You mm -hmm. know, so we have to depend on Allah as much as we can at, at all times. It's not just when you're in need of Him, it's actually at all times. We just sometimes don't realize that. I think that's one, uh, one effect that I have. Uh, if we could play the slides, I just wanted to kind of give uh, kind of like a, a map of where, uh, you know, Ghazi is on the map. I don't know, it's kind of small, but if hopefully people can see that. On the big screen, they can, inshallah. Okay, perfect, perfect. So if you look at the, the bottom left, that's the Rafa Egyptian border, okay? Uh, so we had a, we landed in Cairo, alhamdulillah, uh, and we had to take almost like, it's about an eight or nine hour car trip, but the whole time it takes about 16 hours because of all the checkpoints that you have to go through. So there's two in Egypt, and then the last one is on the Palestinian side. Um, so that's the Rafa border, and then some of the circles are where, where each of the physicians were at. Alhamdulillah. So the, the first one, uh, the, I don't know if it's pink, or, or I can't tell the color, uh, but the first circle uh, is the European hospital. So that's the hospital that most of the medical mission trips go to. Um, and that street that you see that's there, it's called the Salahuddin Street. That's the main street in Gaza, and the problem is right once you get to where, the, where that circle is, the uh, Israeli army is occupying the entire street. So you're not able to actually go up that street. You have to make a left, so to speak, on this picture and go to the, uh, to the beach. And that's where you see all of those pictures and videos of all of the refugees on the beaches and all the aid dropping there. So we had to go on that uh, street. And it was interesting because actually I was honored. Dr. Haif was in, in my group. I mean, I was in her group. So it, was, it was very exciting, mashallah, to be with her. Um, so some of the reflections that she shared and all the things that we were thinking about when we were there is, you know, there's a, a, a curfew between 10 a.m and 2 p.m. Mm. And so we're supposed to leave, you know, before sunset, ideally. When you drive at night, it's very dangerous. Um, so subhanAllah, like, the, 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 the customs took about eight hours. Uh, so we were actually leaving after Muslim. Uh, so when we were driving, uh, Dr. Hafa was mentioning, you know, we should all be repeating, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, in case we have a missile strike, and this is our last words. So sometimes we'd have small conversations with each other, and then immediately after we'd say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And this was the whole trip for an hour and a half. All you hear is the murmuring in our van of like, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So in case that we were to die, um, alhamdulillah, you know, that would be our last words. So as we're traveling up, if you can bring the, the map back up. If, as we're traveling up, you can see that little, um, I guess it's a lightning bolt. So I'm not sure if you guys remember, um, but you know, the World Food Kitchen, uh, that's where their trucks were, stri they were struck right there at that exact point. And if, subhanAllah, it's kind of amazing because we were on that exact street just two hours before. SubhanAllah. So, SubhanAllah, Allah protected us just by two hours. When we got to the hospital, we heard about these, about these deaths that happened, SubhanAllah, and it was like the exact same street. So again, just reflecting on, on the fact that we, we always have to trust in Allah. So that orange circle, I mean the blue circle that you see there, that's where uh, myself, uh, Dr. Jarman, and a lot of Dr. Haifa's work was done at that, in that blue circle. It was called Shuhada Al-Aqsa. Uh, to be honest, it's like the hospital with the coolest name. So, I was hoping that, you know, we could all be shuhad out there, but uh, Allah had other plans. Um, and then the circle all the way to the top, that's uh, like orange, uh, that's a shifa. And obviously that was a hospital that they destroyed about three or four months, uh, three or four weeks ago. And you guys all saw the pictures of that. Uh, and then mashallah Farhan, uh, he'll tell the story, but he was one of the first doctors since the start of the war that got to go to the north. Uh, so he was in that red dot, like all the way up north, and he'll tell stories about that. Um, so just go to the next slide real quick. I think I can do that, yeah. So just to give you an idea, all my picture's in the way, sorry about that. Uh, but so it really is an open air prison. If you can see those walls on the left hand picture, it's basically got a gigantic cement wall, uh, then barbed wire about five or six feet high. If you look at the second picture, you can see that man that's sitting there on the, on the, on the floor. You can see how actually tall those walls are, um, subhanAllah. So it's actually quite high, and then again above that by another five or six feet is barbed wire. So it truly is like, like a prison as you're going into Pama. Mm. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this is a video. So this is as you're driving through Khan Yunus, which is the second province, so to speak, in Gaza. Uh, if you could play the video, you can just see, I mean, you probably all have seen this, but as you're driving, this is the destruction that you see. Uh, basically, Khan Yunus is almost completely destroyed. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, again, it's, uh, what, what can you say, subhanAllah. Um, yeah, but it's just a bunch of rubble. Okay, so if we can go to the next one, the next slide, and I can just show you what uh, what it's like when we were at the hospital. So if you can, so this is basically from taken from the second floor. Uh, you can see all of the camps from that line, one hospital wall all the way across. So you play the video. Uh, you can see I'm, I'm basically panning across the entire hospital compound, and there's about eight thousand refugees in these camps. 
And these, they're tents. Literally, they're just like plastic pieces of paper put together uh, that don't protect you from rain, that you can see someone's shadow that's sitting right next to you. Um, I mean, there's about, for every single bathroom that they have, there's about two or 300 people using that one bathroom. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of diseases like hepatitis A that is rampant in the community. They literally call it like a pandemic. About 50% of the patients that I saw uh, in the hospital had, had hepatitis A. Uh, and the last thing I'll share, which is kind of interesting, is just to kind of set the scene for what these guys will be saying. So when we're at Shuhad al-Aqsa Hospital, on, on the next slide, uh, there's a constant, constant hum of a sound, and you can hear it here. So that sound that you hear, it's only two seconds long, but that is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop, and that's a drone. So that drone is flowing around the entire area, and it's not stopping, it's continuous. So every time we recorded something, for instance, if, if the sheikh was giving, like, leading salah in Qiyam, you'd record something, and you could hear that while he's recording. You can hear it during Tarawih, Qiyam, Isha, any time that you're talking, you can hear that in the background. And just imagine the people that have to go through this constant surveillance while living in this, in this area. It's completely unbelievable, the, the amount of faith that they have, and to still pray, but to be in that situation. I think that's something that was the, the, the biggest impact that I had, that these people are still praying, still fasting in the month of Ramadan, but Allah's putting them through this, they must have so much, such a strong Iman. And that, that's something that I think that, even though I came there to help people, I, I, I'm the one that really benefited from the trip. And so if anybody has the opportunity to go, I highly, highly recommend it because you will, you will not think, there's not a single trip in the world that you can take that will, that will be as beneficial as for your Iman. Jazakallah, Dr. May Allah subhanahu wa reward you for this, Ya Rabbil Alameen. I know there are some stories you shared with me also dealing with that skid and Taraweeh, and we're gonna come to it, inshallah, to baraka with that some point with Allah Azza But I wanna move right now to Dr. Haifa. Um, obviously, uh, uh, I was surprised when I saw you actually on that video. I didn't know that you, were, uh, you, you were there, subhanAllah. So may Allah subhanahu bless you and reward you for taking uh, uh, the, the chance uh, to be there, alhamdulillah. We went together, uh, alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin, to different areas really of to, to seek and you know, to, to uh, help the Muslim community around the world, alhamdulillah, Rabbi Amin, during the disaster and the, and the, and the earthquakes. But to go to Gaza, that's a very unique experience. We want to hear from you, and, and if you can draw these parallels, actually, subhanAllah, between a man-made disaster like what's happening in Gaza, and also what we saw in the, in the, um, the situation that happened actually after the, the earthquake in Turkey now. Yeah, if I can have the slides, because as I'm talking, some of the slides will make it easier. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. I'm completely different than uh, Dr. Atar, actually. Um, I begged people to go. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, since I learned there was physicians going, I don't know how many applications I filled. For some reason, Allah didn't want it to happen. And then I was going to Umrah, and in the plane, I was filling the application. My friend says, this is going to happen. And 10 days, nobody answered me. Then I made the dua, and that's the first thing I want everybody to really know. And I'm not saying this bragging, a'udhu billah. But when you really want something from Allah, and you are wanting it only for Him, he opened it. Suddenly I remembered, I was in Mecca, I was also in Umrah. The last 10 days of Ramadan is my only vacation the whole year and I booked it and I paid and everything. And then I remember there was a physician from Canada who somebody put her picture on a group that we have in Southern California and says, Dr. Elvi went. So I texted, the, I texted her. And I don't know the woman and she said, Dr. Haifa, do you really wanna go? And I said, yes, I do. She said, we can't get you on the April 1st because it's full. We'll get you on the 15. I said, I can't do the 15. I work, I'm back on the 15. She said, let me see. We have to get a lot of, there's a lot of approvals you have to go on. You're talking here, I think we were like day 12 or 13 of Ramadan. Long story short, she said, yes, you are going, but that doesn't mean anything because you can easily get to Cairo and then they will deny you. I said, fine. I'm completely opposite to everybody. I didn't tell anyone. I told only one, three people one of them was actually a person who I said, if I don't come back, Jannah Institute will be for you. And I didn't tell my family, because they will go crazy. And I didn't say anybody. I took all this, I didn't uh, post anything when I was there. And if I can have the slides, because I want you to read the first thing that I put in this slide. I ha have a lot of much longer, but I just made it as short as possible. This was supposed to be a medical mission but it was not a medical mission. It was anything but a medical mission. The first thing you see here is April 1st, is when we actually entered Gaza. And that day will be with me till the day I leave this world. Nothing like 
the feeling when you enter Gaza, and this is what you see. If I, oh, I think I have to move, please forgive me. Am I? The next, yes. This is what you see. As you come out <coughs> from the immigration, from Gaza, you, you look and you see, and this is exactly what it is, I love Gaza. Right, we reached there about five o'clock, if I remember, and we left the hotel in Cairo at 4 a.m. But we didn't leave till after Maghrib. And Allah had a reason, because we could be the people that were bombed, subhanAllah. We're the last people to leave that. And the beauty of it, and I have a video, but again, because of the time, that as we were there, and suddenly I hear somebody reading Quran, if you remember, the young man who was reading Al Ayatul Kursi. This is something norm in Gaza. Everybody read Quran beautifully, young and old. You don't ask people, are you a hafal? Literally, it's an insult. Because mm -hmm. they will look at you and say, five ajza, ten. Oh, I'm not yet a hafal. Oh, I'm not only a hafal. You remember, Abdullah. I'm the Safwa, I'm the special one. As you enter, as you're going closer to the hospital, this is what you see. This is the norm. Children, donkey is the main way of transportation, and children are uh, uh, guiding it. And then people are walking. And then you come in here, and then what I heard, and I, I've never seen, and I have never heard, I remember the hadith of Rasul as I was sorry. walking, completely the opposite, in Jannah, that you will see that what no eyes have seen and no uh, ear have heard, this is Gaza. The things you see, whatever words somebody just asked me and I said words are hollow, has no meaning, because what you see. It's the misery, but at the same time the resilience. The, the sadness, at the same time the happiness. And it's, it's amazing, subhanAllah. And if you go to the next, and this is especially for the youth. If I can get this bigger, remove my picture because I want you to see. The one on the left uh, it will be your right, the cans. So we arrived to the hospital at 8 p.m. Where is everybody? They took us to the administration offices. Where are they? They all were praying Aisha, if you remember. And we joined. Was it only Aisha? Now you're talking about drones, and any minute we can get a missile or an F-16. They did a full tarawih. The amazing is you don't know who's the imam. Because every two ruka'at, somebody go back and saw another person come to the front. All of them reading beautifully. And they were fuqaha. Because they chose from the Quran. They didn't read like the whole Jews. They picked up ayat. And every ayah the Imam read is related to where they are. Talk about sabr. Talk about don't despair. Talk about Allah's victory is coming. It's amazing. And then they, we met them and they said, your iftar is in the room. So you go to the room, and that's what you get. It was three cans, and we were lucky because we were physicians. They actually gave us a piece of bread. So of course, I was personally very hungry. So I ate only the hummus, the, the, you see it open. And all night I was throwing up. And I said, may Allah forgive us. The spoiled people coming from America, we cannot even eat this and they were living on it. Three days later, after the world kitchen, they were killed. Now you start seeing more things coming. And I couldn't believe when I saw eggs. Three days later from my window, and I told Dr. Hina was my roommate, I think I'm seeing eggs. He said, I think so too. Ran down, I bought four eggs for 10 shekels. It's almost $3, four eggs. And we were wondering how I'm going to do the boiled egg. Alhamdulillah, um, Baha, the, the head nurse, she said, don't worry, doctora, we can fix it. When I ate the eggs, may Allah forgive us. As if I ate whatever you, everyone in this room loves. Because before that, we were, we were eating on protein bars three days. Subhanallah. Now, if you go to the next one, this is one of the memorable moments for me in that trip. This is where we prayed taraweeh and we prayed qiyam. And the qiyam starts about 12.15, 12.30 till 3, 3.30. The Imam Abdullah is 21, 22, reading amazingly, fluently, 
enjoying it normally. And again, I'm sharing, I'm not a person who loves the, uh, the um, dua that everyone does. I love to ask Allah me, except with Abdullah. The way he was making dua, the way he was asking Allah, you can tell. And I'm sure Allah will respond to him. It's just the timing, we don't know when. The boy, that the young boy on the left, it's probably on your right side. That boy, his, his, his uh, video was viral, if you remember. There was a video online where the boy was, had a broken arm. And then they were doing cast. And they didn't have pain medication. And he was reciting Quran. It was that boy. <coughs> How did I notice? We were praying, and then at, this is 1.30 a.m. under the drones in a room, least to say uncomfortable. Don't talk about the bathrooms. And this boy comes in and join. Join the man, like a young man. And then Abdullah finished the two rukat, and this young man ran to Abdullah. I don't know what they were talking. Suddenly, this boy becomes the imam. He led us. And then had not done, sat, looked at us, and he started making an ashid about Palestine. What of words? They all speak fluently, excellent, eloquent Arabic. Those were raised to be leaders. Wallah, more than one boy. And I, what I was impressed is by the boys and by the women. No. Amazing. If you look at the next one, this is the scene. This is the hospital. This is actually the door of the hospital. If you see the green at the end, this was actually the small store where everybody buys from. All these, this is supposed to be the main entrance of the parking. Now it's all tense. Everything is tense. If you go to the next one, this is a video actually. It's the drone which you also, I don't know if I'm gonna, okay. These, pay attention. These are the bullets that they target one part of the body, and uh, Dr. Shadna saw a lot of it. They target legs. Subhanallah, legs. And you see all these, the, uh, the, the bullets. This is the scene, the next one, is the scene from the ER, and you lived it. Literally, the ER is like this room right now. If I want to go to see a patient, I am going to say, excuse me, please excuse me. Salaam alaikum, please excuse me. And now you're sitting and you're comfortable. In between, you see people on this side uh, bleeding. There's gauze on the floor. <clears throat> people are moaning. There's people who don't know who they are. It's an amazing scene. I've never seen it in my life. The impressive thing from everybody. And eight days we lived this. I have never heard a word of complaint. Only one word, and it is not a complaint. And this was actually from the head nurse. She looked at me and I said, how are you feeling? She said, Doctor, ta'abna, we're tired. That is it. For eight days, this is what we heard. Dr. Now, the last day, finally, they allowed me to go to the um, maternity hospital because the, the, where the maternity hospital was inside the Shifa, I'm sorry, inside the Aqsa, but because of the war, they made it all trauma center and they moved all the deliveries to this hospital. So the last day, I was actually fortunate to go. They used to do five deliveries a day. Now they do 50 deliveries a day, 10 C-sections per day. I did two. Out of patient privacy and haya, I couldn't put it. They don't have, they don't have scrubs. They don't have sheets to cover the patient. No, Normally they bring the instruments and then you open the instruments here and then you throw it. They don't throw it. That, they cover the patient. And I said, and said, Dr. Haifa, what size gloves you are? And I said, I'm five and a half. They said, we're sorry, it's only seven and a half. The instruments they showed me literally needs to be in the museum. No, and that's how they work. They take the patients to the recovery room there is no monitors. There's no blood pressure. Your wife did a C-section. They actually, they called us in the middle. Patient was bleeding. And I said, what is her blood pressure? They all looked at me. And I literally did the old way. I held her pulse and I said, her pulse is fine. She's okay. Just get a fluid. And there is no stance to put fluid. Somebody was holding the fluid. Dr. Haifa, in, in the last minute, if I may ask you, 
um, now that you talk about this, this particular uh, aspect of it, the ladies in Gaza. The next slide. What's your experience with those ladies in Gaza? The next slide, if I can have it. Ladies, everyone, I, this, is, this is one who really left an impression on me. It's a long story, but because of the time, I actually put it on the social media for those of you who follow. Ladies, for eight days, this is what I saw. I did not see a hair in this all eight days. Every lady was covered, young and old. And, they, and, I, and I looked at them, and one, one of them, she said to me, so we, if we die, we die covered. Oh, no, no. This is how they talk. That's number one. Number two, they're strong. I didn't see a woman whining. Where is your husband? Martyr. Shuhada, the name is like martyr. Where is your son? He's still in the north. Where is your daughter? She went with her husband to the, um, to the south. They are, this is how I feel, Allah prepared them for this. Allah knows if it was us, how we would have responded. Oh. Every woman was sabira. The, the sahabiyat you hear about, you read about, I did see them with my own eyes. La Allah. There was a woman who I put her picture after I took her permission. You enter the hospital on the left, on the right side. Remember? You all remember, because this is where the, you, we go, where we pray. There was a small, literally, mattress. The woman is maybe in her 50s, there. I go in, she's there. I come out, finally I spoke to her. And she said, I've been living in this for the last three months. Where is your husband? Husband and the son still in the north with my daughter. What do you eat, whatever they give us? Please forgive me. Where do you go with the bathroom? Wherever everybody else goes. Not a single word of complaint. Nobody said, why me? No. Why us? You know how this is common for us. No one, subhanAllah. No. And then this is as we were. The last day they moved us earlier to the south. Again, they said for security, this is what we saw. This is the norm. On your right, on your left, everything is destroyed. And then here, in one of the best memory is the Eid Salah. The last maybe 20 years, every Eid of Ramadan, I'm in Mecca. Nothing like this Eid. Nothing like this Eid. The, the mosque, actually, they told us, don't go. It's very dangerous. They may attack. Because there was the rumor inside the hospital that the Eid will be black Eid. They throw some like brochure saying Eid will be black. So they told us, don't go. We went. And if you pay attention to the window, the window is shattered. And then these are the girls coming for Eid. We gave a little bit of chocolate. Remember? And it was riots. And we stopped. And I was like, Ya Allah, what is a chocolate? Let alone if you wanted to give money. But they were, look at the girls. They were smiling. They were fine. They were, that's how it is. Yeah, you leave the Eid. And this is what you see. The norm, these kids are alone. They, there is a category called orphan with no parents. Alone. No parents, no family. By himself. That's one of the examples. This was in the European hospital in the last day. And this was the last. The, the, this is a smile. This is a girl displaced. She was in the European hospital. She's an artist. And she was painting on the walls of the hospital. And this one says, Eidukum Nasrukum. Your real Eid is the day you are victorious. This is she, and then she showed me all her portfolio. She says, I keep painting. This is a displaced girl living in a tent. I'm glad she has a, p a piece of paper and no. um, uh, a pen. And she was absolutely happy, subhanAllah. And talk, I asked everybody I met, what do you want from us? Actually, I asked, did we even do anything? I mean, you really feel your, I am useless in front of all this tragedy. They said, no, your presence was the best gift you give us. So I, I second, anyone can go. And you know what? People tell me, you went to your death. I said, wherever we are, we, death is going to come to us. If I was supposed to die, I'm, I'm going to die. 
So if you can go, definitely go. And the second thing they said to me, and I'm sure to all of you, is talk about us. Don't let people forget us. We exist. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy on them. Amen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your, for your experience over there and for being there for our brothers and sisters as well too. Alhamdulillah. What, what, a, what a, a, a privilege really to, to be in the presence of you guys, mashallah bringing this experience to all of us over here, really seeing the reality of life. Like we really feel sometimes that we're living a uh, fantasy. It's not real, but that's the reality of life. Dr. Bilal, um, you went before everybody. And I saw your videos, mashallah, when you were there. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you and reward you for being there as a pioneer for all this group to, to be in that, in that area. We want to hear from your experience, inshallah, Tabarak. Tell us what happened there. Yeah, can you stand up? Yeah. Please, go ahead. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam wa rashafir anbiya wa salim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasul al-Kareem A'udhu billahi minash shaytan ar-Rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Kula nafsin zaiqatu al-Mawud Wa innama tuwaffawna ujulakum yawm al-Qiyamah Wa man suhzih an al-Nari wa udkhil al-Jannah faqad faaz Wa mal hayatu al-Tunya illa mata'u al-Gurur Katabluwanna fi imbalikum wa anfusikum wa rasma'unna min al-lazina utu al-Kitab min qablikum wa min al-lazina shakoo adhan kathira وَإِن تَسْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا فَإِنَّ ذَارِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذ جعل الذين كفروا في قلوبهم في قلوبهم الحمية حمية الجاهلية أنزل الله السكينة على رسوله وعلى المؤمنين وأنزمهم كلمة التقوى وكانوا حقا بها وأهلها وكان الله بكل شيء عليما صلى الله لزيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, first of all, correction, uh, Dr. Farhan Abdul Aziz was the first who gave, uh, went before me, oh. and then he mashallah, went again. I forgot uh, about his first trip, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And if you can just uh, put on the slides and uh, keep moving. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah wa nusalli ala Rasul al-Kareem. As the uh, Sheikh mentioned, basically, when we went there, and as uh, uh, Dr. Haifa mentioned, and everybody else, like, uh, people say that you saved, uh, you went there to save lives. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave the opportunity to save few lives and touch many. But in fact, there we learned what life is, and, it's, uh, and what death is. And as uh, uh, this ayah I just uh, recited, there we actually learned what, like the living Quran, what it means. And the, but the, the, the topic of the program, what is it like to be in Gaza? That is what I was thinking when going from here. And when we entered Gaza, and despite the sudden chaos, little chaos around the truck with food which just entered with us and despite the destruction all around us and despite the drone going over in the air all the time and despite the ongoing attacks and despite the all shops closed and despite the people in the streets, I felt there this Sakina which you cannot explain, you cannot describe in any other way. And that Sakina was everywhere, not only like on, on the Muslims, but the people number one there, and then the Muslims, even non-Muslims who were with us, one of our senior doctors said, I'm having a better sleep than my own home here in Fazla. <laughs> this was the Sakina there, which you can imagine. And then uh, we reached the hospital, and I think we were in the same hospital, Shohada al-Aqsa, and I used to say there, Inshallah min mustashfa al-Aqsa ila masjid al-Aqsa. So there, uh, one day, uh, and this was my experience, that during Ramadan, and I came in the middle of Ramadan, I came back, there were increased attacks during the time of Sahur and Aftar. And one day there was Nusirat camp attack, uh, and that was in the news, where 20, and this was close to Sahur time, close to 25, 30 people of the same family got shaheed, and then multiple brought to the hospital, and this uh, slide shows like uh, sort of where we are. So uh, multiple people got brought to the uh, hospital and uh, multiple were uh, uh, like shaheed and multiple were injured. And uh, we were talking with uh, different people. Uh, one, they were like grandparents, parents, and then uh, like the kids, young girls, boys. And one uh, gentleman was taking care of his parents who were both pretty sick. And during that time, when I was there, as Dr. Athar mentioned, I did not know much Arabic very well. So uh, the, 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 the son, he came to me and he asked like, uh, where are you from? So I said, which I was saying there to many people, Jamin al-America, Asli min al-Pakistan, Murud al-Taif, 
Wadami Palestine. But it means that I have come from America, I'm originally from Pakistan, I was born in Thai Saudi Arabia, but my blood is Palestinian. And then I would say Arabi Shoya Shoya. So, so with Shoya Shoya Arabi and his Shoya Shoya English, we were talking. But then he brought somebody, a chef, Pakistani type looking, turban, Pakistani style, Pakistani style kameez, and he came and talked to me in Urdu, kahan se hai where are you from? I said, I'm from Pakistan. Where are you from? Are you from Pakistan? He said, no, I'm from Palestine, Gaza. I lived in Pakistan for five years and that's how I know Urdu. And I was graduated from that institute and we were talking and smiling and having a good time. And then I asked, what are you doing here? And he said, uh, yeah, I mean, these are all my family. This is my brother, this is my sister, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, kids, nieces. And yes, this morning my daughter got Shaheed, my son-in-law got Shaheed, just like that. And he's still smiling and I'm looking at him and I'm about to cry. That is the, that, that are the people. You may say that that was a chef, Molana, an ophthalmologist doctor talking. He said, I moved from North Gaza. My home is just right. My father got Shaheed. My son, five years old, his school is just right. My wife who's a pediatrician and son, they are living in Rafa in tent and I'm in the hospital working. Alhamdulillah, Hasbunallah, Hunaymulwaki. You may say that these are the men only, but as Dr. Haifa mentioned, and I hope we get time in discussion, how women are actually the backbone there in Gaza. And I believe not only in Gaza, but all over the world, women are being the backbone of this movement. So the medical students, uh, yeah, and, uh, I think that picture went by, but the medical students, if you would have seen many uh, girls, uh, they were like so determined and so strong. And again, you would ask them, What's going on? They will say, yes, we moved from North Gaza because their medical schools were in North Gaza, which were all destroyed. And this was not their hospital. And they say, like, uh, uh, if we can go back to the, uh, the slide, but yeah, this one and then next uh, the, with the back and then stay there. Uh, uh, no, uh, uh, yes, here, and I will, we'll play this video in one minute. So this, uh, th those girls, they will always say, that, uh, yeah, we just came from the tent, our medical schools are destroyed, but when we gave them this, uh, and these girls like are in the camps living, but at the same time they still want to help, and they wanted to establish a clinic close to their tent, close to their camp, and we took some uh, supplies from the, there, and uh, we gave to them, if you can play the video, but after getting the supplies, the thing which they said, thank you, everything, but then they said, do not give up the fight. Do not give up. Keep raising the voice. And that's here I would like to end that despite that chaos, despite the suffering, despite the lines for the food and everything, three things which I have seen in them and three things which I would request all of us to do. So number one thing which is to keep raising the voice. As I said in that video, that, uh, that uh, medical student, she said, do not give up and keep raising the voice because if nobody else is hearing, we are hearing. We see it, we look at it, and this all that, our, our sadness, our, uh, all the sufferings go away when we see the people are raising voice for us all over the world. Mm -hmm. Number two, keep donating and keep supporting the relief organizations. Like I saw many non-Muslim people there standing up. World Central Kitchen, you have all seen that. And I think as a Muslim community, we have not like uh, stood up for them as they have stood up for us, but they are like there for us. So World Central Kitchen, for example, Met Global with whom I went, they are like sort of many non-Muslims there. Al Khidmat I saw there from Pakistan, Helping Hand is going to work with Met Global, multiple organizations, but, and there are long lines outside of the trucks, but some aid is still going in, so please do not stop supporting. Third thing which we need to do, and before that, I tell what three things I saw in them. Number one, illa mataul hurur, the ayah which I recited in the beginning, and that is what my question was from the day one, how they are so satisfied and so happy despite all that. And the answer I got from two ways. Number one, I was standing one side outside the ER, house hospital, and a doc and doctor passing by who was the chairman of the ER and I asked him that how you people are so satisfied despite all that. He said, doctor, listen, every night when we go to sleep, we go to be ready for shahada. We are ready for istishhar because there is nothing for us in this world. Our best place is in Jannah. 
And second answer I got, one day I also sneaked out, few days, I won't, I won't admit how many days, but one morning when I sneaked out of the hospital, went to the masjid, and there they were reciting this Quran, Mal hayatu dunya illa mata'ul gurur. I said, yes, that is the answer, that they have figured it out, that this life is nothing but an illusion. But despite that, three things which they believe in, personal accidents. Each of the medical students whom I talked to, they, had, they still have the hopes. And I asked them, you still have the dreams? They said, yes, this will be over. I want to be neurosurgeon. I want to be an anesthesiologist. I want to be this. I want to be that. They are living the life in the best way possible, in the worst conditions possible. Because they know they are having Jannah. Second thing is their belief that Baituna or Jannah. They're either our home or Jannah. This is the personal goal of each one of them. And the third goal, and here I will end, which I want all of us to have that goal, if we can put that uh, slide there, that I saw this picture in each and every one of the many of the homes and offices and uh, that picture, the second last picture or third last, where uh, just before coming, they uh, sort of like uh, were giving us a farewell. And in the director's office, I saw this picture, it's in the back. And if you can go to the next slide. So this, al Qudsu Lana. This is their collective goal, all of people of Gaza and Palestine. And that is what they want us to have the goal. Not because we are chosen people, not because we were there thousands of years ago, not because we have certain passports, but because we are the people who believe in Allah, we are the people who believe in all the prophets, and we are the people who stand up for the justice. So that is what we all have to keep this goal in front of us. al Qudsulana. one day as we are praying here, we all have to go as Ummah to that Masjid Al-Aqsa and inshallah pray and raise Allahu Akbar there. Wa akhru da'wana. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Bira. Thank you very much. Barakallah. May Allah subhanahu wa bless you. Bless your effort, Ya Rabbi Ramin, and reward you for all what you've done. I'm sure that many, alhamdulillah, lives have been touched because of Vajidah. Uh, uh, Barakallah. Jazakallah khair. Now, Dr. Farhan, your turn, inshallah, Azza wa Jal. Um, look, there's so much you're going to be talking about, but there's one area I don't want you to miss it because I've seen the videos in the pictures, the children of Gaza. You be the one of the sitting with them and, 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 and chanting Rashid with them and reciting Quran with them, subhanAllah. I want to hear from you as you speak on your experience, the children of Gaza, because I personally believe, based on what I've seen and heard, I think the children of Gaza, they skipped childhood. They were born adults, they were born men, wallahi. Seriously, like they skip childhood completely. Because when you hear them speaking, it's like Allahu Akbar. Seven years old kids, five years old kids speak like a, a full grown up. Like they have goals, they have dreams, and they're serious, and they talk with, you can have a conversation with them. Today, people in their 20s, you barely could have a conversation with them. So tell us your experience with the Kabul Gaza and the children as well. <laughs> And I just wanted to, just before I answer that question, uh, obviously thank everyone for coming and a particular thanks to some of my coworkers from the hospital who are here. I'm in scrubs, not to convince you that I'm a doctor, but I have shifts in 45 minutes. I'm working overnight tonight. Um, but special thanks to Lindsay and her husband, Mike, who came here. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a going out of your comfort zone to be guests at the mosque. We're very happy to have you here and I want to thank you for being here. And I'm not sure if Jasmine made it out or anybody else, but whoever is here, thank you so much for coming and I, I hope I hope the experience is warm for you, welcoming. You're always welcome here at our community. You're part of our family, and uh, thank you for the support. Um, the children of Gaza. Uh, I, I forgot who said it, but it was like you meet Sahaba, and you read the Sahaba stories, and you read about young men and women who are leading armies at 17 years old, and who are um, profound examples, like Abdullah bin Zubair, and, and Anas ibn Malik, and these young companions, and you, you, you know, I was having a discussion with a, a, a physician. Honestly, it's jumbling because I, I spent two days at European, two days at Aqsa, and ten days in the north um, on this most recent trip. And um, I'm forgetting where I was when we had this conversation. But regardless, um, we were sitting eating iftar with one of the anesthesiologists. He invited us to his, his home. And his home is a room maybe eight by ten feet. Um, in the hospital, in the operating room, one, in, in, the, in, the, in the OR area, one of the offices has now become his family's home. And so he, his wife, his daughter, who's a medical student, and so this is at European, because I remember I worked with her in the ER. Um, so my last day there. And, um, 
uh, a younger daughter and a, and a son. The son is 16 years old and he's half of the Quran. And so over iftar, we were discussing, and so the younger girl amongst them said, you know, we should try and leave Gaza. And, and so the son, who's 16, he said, why would you say that? And she said, well, there's no future left for us. Like, everything is destroyed. And then, so then he began asking a series of questions. And I was thinking about this as I'm just taking this in. Like, if, if we're in that position, we're living out of an 8 by 10 room, 80 square feet is your home for the last however many months, besides the starvation and fatigue and the overwork and no pay and all of that that comes with it. And uh, his response was very telling. He, he asked his sister, he said, well, who was feeding us before the war? Hmm. And she said, Allah. So then, she said, so then he said, well, who will feed us after the war? And so she said, Allah. And so he said, who gave us shelter before the war? Allah. Who will give us shelter after the war? Allah. This is questions coming from a 16-year-old boy, half of the Qur'an, to his younger sister. So the, the, the level of tarbiyah, the level of um, maturity, uh, with all due respect, <laughs> and Lindsay, uh, she knows what it's like in the ERs, you know, um, you see what they go through and a seven-year-old boy there is more than a man than many of us here. And that's the reality. Um, and the same thing for the women, the, the girls. The level of maturity, and you have to understand, they, 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 they're seeing all this trauma firsthand. So like at European hospital in the South, where I went on my first trip, the, the um, unfortunately there's no school. School has been canceled for the year, right? Um, there is a Qur'an school and a Qur'an program at European Hospital. Um, but most of the kids are just running around. And so in the ER, you're trying to work. And like Dr. Haifat said, it's, you can't walk three steps in the ER without somebody stopping you and getting your attention. See my loved one, see my father, see my mother, see my daughter. Whether they could be, they could be on the third floor of the hospital, but they're pulling you from the ER to go there. Um, but amongst this crowd of people, you have patients, you have their families. Then you also have the children running around. And so you have donkey carts bringing in bodies, dismembered bodies of patients, and the kids are just taking it all in, they're just seeing it. And they're not blinking an eye. So the loss of innocence also, it's something that's very sad. But um, I did, and, and when I was in the South, I spent, I spent time with the kids a lot. We would have halaqas every night. We, we, made a, we designated a place called Masjid al-Sigar for the, for the children, and we would read the Quran there and have halaqas there and tell stories. Um, and one of the, maybe inshallah if I get a chance I'll share the video on social media, but one of the things I was sharing right now actually was, so after at Salat Aisha, we prayed Aisha and Jama'ah, myself and the kids, and then one of the girls, she was 12 years old, she, before the halaqah, she recited Quran to start the halaqah. Uh, her name is Wa'ad, and uh, she's a hafida by the way. Mashallah. And so she began Surah Al-Baqarah, and subhanAllah, she didn't get through the first five ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah when gunfire started going, a machine gun, started going off immediately behind us. Immediately behind us. Like the loudest, obviously we hear the drones, we hear the missiles, we hear the quadcopters, we hear the bombs, it shakes the walls, it shakes the windows, it shakes your body, you feel all of that. But I never heard gunfire that close. And so she's reciting Quran, sitting next to me, and gunfire is going on behind us, and she didn't blink an eye. And she kept reciting. And I'm thinking in my head, what's protocol? Do we need to get the kids to safety? Do we need to get them inside? You know, and there's like five or six dads around, you know, there's maybe 30, 40 kids there, and, and the moms, some of the moms were there. And she just kept reciting. And then nothing. <laughs> just kept going until she finished the, like a whole page and a half, then I stopped her. I said, that's enough. Uh, the, 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 everybody in Gaza is amazing, um, but the kids are like little angels, subhanAllah. So they have, they have a completely different norm, right? Completely different. Different than ours? Different than, different than ours? <laughs> yeah. Inshallah. Uh, Night and day. <laughs> now, now um, I know I saw some of the videos with, with these kids uh, chanting Nasheed and saying salam to the Valley Ranch community here. Yes. Tell us about that experience with these kids. Yeah, we, um, it was interesting. So the first, the first uh, one of the first days I sat with them, how the Quran halaqah came about and the halaqahs. Um, so when you get out at European hospital, the first thing, all the kids love saying is hello, because <laughs> they want to show they know English. So I'll say, why don't you say salam? You get 10 good deeds, salam, I get 20 good deeds. I'm trying to teach them salam, but they just want to show off that they know the English language to say hello. And so, they, you know, they gravitate to, 
to you know foreigners and stuff, and so I spent time with them, and I tried to make our relationship not based on candy because, like you said, you can't really give out candy because it becomes a riot. So it's it's very tricky. You have to get people from there to, to do it. But um, so I said they said they wanted to sit and, and 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 sit together with me. So I said okay, but then it was close to Maghrib time, and I had to read Surah Kahf. Mm-hmm. I hadn't read Surah Kahf yet, and so. I, uh, I had like six and a half pages left of the surah. And I said, I have to finish first. Are you guys okay with that? They said, sure, no problem. So I, I sat and I recited. I said, okay, come back when I'm done. They just sat there or stood. Most of them actually stood. So the few like in front of me sat and the rest stood. And for six and a half pages, of the they just sat and listened to the whole recitation. And then after I finished, I said, they wanted to recite with me. I said, look, if we do ayah ayah, we're not going to finish my maghrib. <laughs> so I said, let me recite. So then we recited surah Fatiha together. I re- recited and they repeated. And then we still had like 10 minutes left before, before Maghrib. And so du'a and mustajab, you know, in the last hour of Maghrib, of, of Yom al Jum'ah. So we all sat and made du'a together. And they all sat and made du'a and said, Ameen. And uh, it was beautiful. And then we played Dr. Goose together. I taught them how to play. They actually didn't know Dr. Goose. They taught me how to say goose in Arabic. And I taught them how to play Dr. Goose. Um, but it was, it was a great experience. And subhanAllah, like, you just want to put a smile on their face, you know, when you, if you can, the Hadith Prophet, even just, you know, wiping the hair of an orphan softens your heart, just spending time with them and letting them smile and, and, and absorbing some of that energy into you. Barakallah inshallah. I hope, inshallah, that our parents today and you can really uh, learn from this experience that, you know what, you can really build these kids at a very young age to become mature. Mature enough to understand life, understand the responsibility and really become productive in the society. Uh, they don't have to go through stuff for trauma just to, uh, to learn that. They can learn, inshallah ta'ala, but the tarbiyah is very important as a community, as one family, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, barakallah fiqh, inshallah ta'ala. Dr. Sharma, right now, I want to hear from you, inshallah, your experience uh, being there, alhamdulillah, with this team. There is no doubt, of course, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a new thing. You guys are experienced in hospitals, but that is a whole different thing. How was that uh, uh, to you, being there? Bismillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. I would say that you know, there's a reason that there's such a big crowd here. It's not because people want to listen to us. Mm. It's because people are attracted to the people of Gaza. And the reason is, if you go, especially if you go there, I mean, you probably already see it, but if you go there, you realize why. It's because the izza of this ummah is concentrated in that one place and in those people. That's, that's izza, why izza and, people, and steroid, right? Yes, I mean, that's why everybody... If, if you look at anywhere in the world, you can, and you say, okay, where does the Ummah have real Izza? I guarantee you that everybody would point to Gaza. They're not going to point to us. They're not going to point to somebody else. Mm. They're going to say the real people of Izza are the people of Gaza, and that's what we saw over there. And that's why I think all of us had such an unbelievable experience. No. Because then we felt what it means to have is as Muslims. Despite the tragedy, despite the difficulty, the first day that uh, I got there, we did an amputation on a woman at this level of her arm and her six-year-old daughter, the same exact level. Because over there, the snipers, basically for the children and women, they aim for their limbs. And they aim with very high power or high caliber ammunition, such that the injury is so uh, devastating in terms of the muscles, the bone, and everything that it's very difficult to reconstruct and salvage that limb. The second day, same thing, seven-year-old girl, uh, amputation at this level because the gunshot was right to the bicep, completely destroyed the bone, the muscle, everything, so there was no way to... Like they're trying to handicap an entire generation, basically. And and that same seven-year-old girl, her sister, 13-year-old, had a gunshot wound to the back of her knee, or back of her calf. The entry wound is in the back, so it tells you that somebody shot her from behind. And there's a huge wound in the front, which is where the, the bullet exited, you know, destroyed her artery. Alhamdulillah, we were able to save that leg. But these were kids that were uh, aimed at. But the patience of the people there, I mean, yeah, it's, it's chaos over there. People are emotional. But in the end, uh, their level of tawakkul in Allah and their level of yaqeen that they are going to be victorious is difficult for us to imagine. 
sometimes you think when somebody's there talking and they're talking about they're going to be victorious, we know we're going to be victorious, we're not leaving, you think, you know, are these, are they just under some kind of delusion? But the real, I would say, the thing that I saw was because, alhamdulillah, we were able to go in Ramadan and, uh, you know, we had Taraweeh and Qiyam. When you hear the Quran, when you're over there, it's like it's a different book. Because when you, when you hear the Quran, when you're living in comfort or ease and you don't have difficulty, a lot of times we take it as information that comes to us. When you're living in difficulty, when you don't know if you're going to be alive tomorrow or not, when you're suffering from pain and loss and all of these things, when you hear the Quran, it's a true re reminder to us. You know, it's a constant reinforcing of our purpose in life, our goals in life. Um, it's building a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that I think for us, maybe the Quran doesn't have that impact unless we really have our mind focused on that. And that's what I learned from, from, from the people over there. I mean, people literally told me, word for word, we have yaqeen that we are going to win. You know, it may not be me, you know, I might die, but me or my children or my grandchildren, but in the end, we believe in the promise of Allah and we are going to win. That level of Iman is, uh, especially in, when you're, you know, in such a dire situation, is uh, unique. And I think that's why all these people and the whole world is really uh, attracted to those people and no. has such uh, admiration for them. SubhanAllah, to, to, to watch uh, Dr. you know, um, I watched uh, some of the videos from doctors over there as well too. So there was a Jordanian doctor talking about treating the child. Um, I believe he was teaching actually his arm. Maybe the same kid probably. And uh, um, so he said the next day they wanted to change and, and, and check on his wound and so forth. So the, the kid told him, and he was a kid, a child. He said, doctor, please don't hurt me again. He goes, last time you hurt me really. Could you please don't hurt me this time? And then eventually, so the doctor told the, uh, you know, to increase the dose on, on anesthesia a little bit. But still, he was hurt. He felt the pain. Then he said, didn't I tell you that you uh, don't, don't hurt me? Then he turned his face, he said, he, goes, he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Rabbi, forgive me, because I asked somebody else besides you. Like, wow. I heard that, I'm just like, what, are, what kind of children are these? Like literally, what kind of kids these are when they now they even, which is natural for them to say, ask a doctor to make it easy on their pain. And he says, forgive me because I asked somebody else besides you. So that's, that's a, a different level, subhanAllah. One last thing I want to mention, uh, uh, I want to ask you guys about your experience in terms of uh, with these circumstances, it was always uh, an expectation of people, of course, you know, fighting for survival. But I read and I heard from other doctors who visited there about the, the, like I said, the izzah of the people, dignity of the people, also the generosity of the people. Like even in these situations, subhanAllah, um, people would not beg. Uh, if they, whatever they have, they're willing to share, subhanAllah. And even I've seen kids sharing whatever they have with other people and they say, I don't have money. And they just said, go ahead, take it. Alhamdulillah. What's your experience with that, with the people, with the, their situation and their generosity? And in the last few minutes, inshallah, we have here. Anyone wants to share? Yeah, actually, so true. Three days after the World Kitchen, as I said earlier, there was some things starts coming, and mm. one of the things came is actually chicken. SubhanAllah. Now, you may be laughing, but to see a chicken after about five days of eating whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you, it's a feast. So there was an um, um, orthopedic resident, Khalil, insisted that we have to feed you a typical Palestinian uh, meal. And then he gave us options and said, msakhan, and I was like, where are you going to get the bread? Bread is a huge issue because there is no flour. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. <coughs> Five minutes before Maghrib, the door uh, 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 knock, we opened. Khalil brings a big, I have a picture of it actually, a big, huge tray. 
and it is so well, not only cooked and generosity, but it's well presented. Next oh. to it is salad, and next to it is a typical Palestinian cookies. Mm. So I said, Khalil, where did you get this? I mean, you need a lot of material. He said, everyone in my family, whatever they had, we brought it all together to bring this. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And I said, you don't have to, inshallah. Uh, we'll come next time and we'll visit you in your... He said, no, no, no. You, you came, you have to. Extremely generous. I fully agree with you. I learned, man kana yuridu al-izza, fa inna al-izza talillahi jamia. Whomsoever wants dignity, dignity is with Allah. And you are absolutely right. Even children, they are walking barefooted, but they have dignity, subhanAllah. Jazakumullah khair, barakallah being I know subhanAllah the experience is just, you guys just gave us the tip of the, the iceberg. That's the, the, the surf, the scratching the surface of that experience. And I hope inshallah that if anyone is interested in learning more, and if they, in whichever capacity they can help, they can reach out to you inshallah to barakallah wa ta'ala. I want to thank you on behalf of the community for being there and delivering that message to us. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless your families, protect you all, ya Rabbil Alameen. And we award you immensely for what you've done for our brothers in Gaza. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our brothers and sisters in Gaza, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shelter them from any harm, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them victory against their enemies, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to restore peace and tranquility in their lives in the dunya, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept their martyrs as shuhada, to heal the wounded, to protect those who are lost. We Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask him to keep them safe, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And the way we all gather here, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us with them in Jannah al firdaus al-A'la. With the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-Salihin ala surah al-Mutaqabilin. Jazakum Allah khairan. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Move back to the section there. And inshallah we're going to call Adam for...